Hello learners, here we come with the lesson 9, My Son Will Not a Beggar Be of Senior Secondary Course in English. Before we go on to the lesson, let us understand a few facts. Who is a beggar? Is he a man on the streets with a bowl in his hand begging for alms? Or he is a helpless person who has been driven to begging because he is not able to earn a livelihood? Is he a disabled or handicapped man who is considered unfit for any job other than begging? Or is he a person who is a burden, a shame and a liability on society? Are all blind men fated to be beggars? Let us now turn our attention to the story, My Son Will Not a Beggar Be. I hope you have read this story and have an idea about it. The story is more of an autobiography. An autobiography is a story about a person written by himself. Therefore, it is always told in the first person, which means the writer uses the first person pronoun, I. Before we go to detailed explanation of the story, let us discuss what it is about. It is about the narrator, Ved, who was just three years old when he lost his vision after suffering from prolonged meningitis. Meningitis is an acute inflammation of the protective membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. Meningitis is most often caused by a bacterial infection. It also may be caused by a virus, fungal infection, parasite, a reaction to certain medications. Since he lost his eyesight at such a small age, he does not remember much about people, friends, colors, generally found in nature. Ved, the author, says since he lost one of his five senses, the sense of sight he had to now live with other four senses. The sense of smell, taste, hearing and feeling. In the initial years, he fumbled, faltered, and bumped into things but soon he adapted himself to the world of darkness. Ved has no regrets of the past as those memories were too short-lived. Ved's father was a doctor who did not leave any stone unturned to get his son cured. When all possibilities were ruled out, he had no choice but to accept the fact that his son would have to live a life of a handicapped person. He learned that in India, most blind children had no future but to beg on streets. He was not ready to accept this fate for his son. He then went from pillar to post trying to find out an institution which helped the blind not only to read and write but also taught them vocational skills. He then made frantic efforts to help his blind son to get proper education and learn skills which will help him to give a dignified and independent life, more or less like a normal person. The story also tells us how the two parents, that is the father and mother, approach their children's problems in two different ways. Let us now turn our attention to the story. Read section 9.1, section 1 on your own. Lies in India as elsewhere too made my way fumbling and faltering. In this part of the story, we are told that Ved, the author, was just three years old when he suffered from the prolonged attack of meningitis and a result of which he lost his eyesight. Ved is thankful that this tragedy happened at such an early stage in life that he has no memory of his childhood days when he could see and enjoy the rich colors found in nature such as the colorful butterflies which fascinate a little child or the games that he could play with his friends and family members. Because a three-year-old child soon forgets things, the author too had on lingering memories of people and other things. Why does Ved feel grateful? He is grateful because a three-year-old child is not grown up enough to remember things for long. Since these memories are totally wiped off from one's mind, he carries no regrets. 
As a result, he adapted to his new world, the world of darkness, much more easily. He also says because he was able to sharpen his other faculties, such as the sense of touch, hear, smell and taste. Ved also considers himself fortunate that he was not able to conceive the value of things which are generally treated or treasured in a sighted world. For instance, to him a description of such as flood of sunshine streaming through the nursery window or the colors of the rainbow or the beauty of the sunset or the moon did not matter much. These words sounded hollow to him. All that he could feel were the warmth of the sun, the slow drizzling sound of the spattering rain, the feel of the air just before nightfall and the smell of the grass on a warm morning. All this shows how his other senses took over and became more sharpened. The author talks about his first experience of fumbling and faltering while groping for his way before he stepped into a totally new universe, the universe of darkness. Now coming to the section 9.2. In this section of the story, we are given some other facts about what followed thereafter and how the family members took their own time to come to terms with the reality. This section also highlights some of the other issues which are faced to uh, ignorance. The narrator again reiterates that he was thankful that the tragedy struck him at a very tender age because he had no baggage of memories to carry with him or any memories to haunt him and make him feel miserable. He lost his sight in November 1937. His father was a doctor working in the public health services. At that time, the family was living in Gujarat in the province of Punjab in northern India. He is referring to India before its partition. After this sickness, his family had moved to Lahore, which was just a few miles away. At Lahore, a number of family members and relatives came to sympathize with his father, and which actually his father did not like. He asked for a transfer to Karnal, where hopefully no one was there to visit or sympathize. They took up accommodation near a canal bank where there was total peace and silence. Why do you think the father did not want visitors or sympathizers? He was a wise man. More visitors meant more noise and mental disturbance. And sympathizers generally tend to weaken the spirit of the affected family. He wanted peace in his house so as to be able to think clearly and decide on his next course of action rather than have people deflect his chain of thought. After moving to Karnal, the family faced a few teething problems, but they soon overcame them. No one in the town knew them. Ved was still weak after a prolonged illness. The servants tried to avoid him as though he were an evil eye personified. His sisters treated him with care as though he was a fragile doll. His mother wept constantly. His father, who was a doctor, was satisfied with the timely treatment his son got. He was rather happy that there was no delay as that would have affected his mind and even endangered his life. However, like others, he too had no hope of full recovery. Now that the family had accepted the facts, there was a period of inaction. Why? The narrator feels this was partly due to the immediate shock that the family received, but more so because those were the days when people were ignorant of the fact that a blind child or man had other capabilities which could be successfully tapped and groomed. Being a doctor, the father should relate better to his son's blindness. Because of his wide experience in the medical field, he could accept the reality in a more rational way. The author feels that this was in a way good and that he was born into not just 
a well-to-do family but also to an excellent trained doctor. Read section 9.3, section 3 of the story. Lines beginning from My mother on the other hand to obtained my consent in advance. In this section, the narrator tells us his mother's approach to her son's blindness and the efforts made to cure his son. Her approach was diametrically opposite to that of her husband's. The narrator's mother refused to believe or accept the fact that her son was going to be blind for the rest of the life. She believed that her son was suffering due to some past sin that she may have committed. Being superstitious, she consulted her family pandit, who she thought was adept in religion and science. He looked at the child's palm and his mother's. He tried to read the lines on her forehead, but confessed he was not able to find the reasons. Other pandits were also called in. They all agreed that she should do some penance for her sin to ward off the evil. The methods recommended by them ranged from intensive prayers to exhaustive exercises. They even charged a heavy fee for their consultation. The mother agreed to perform whatever was told to her, but she kept them a secret from her husband because she knew that he did not have faith in pandits and would disapprove of their methods. She even consulted Hakims and physicians who practiced Yunani system of medicine. They prescribed medicines and surmas for the eyes. She administered all these medicines in all sincerity, even though they hurt the child's eyes. One day, her husband heard the child's cries and went to find out what happened. When he came to know about the medicines, she was trying on him. He strictly forbade him from going to Hakim's. He then took him from his mother's arms and gently bathed his eyes, which were stinging due to the pain. The mother stopped going to the Hakim's, but off and on, she would put the surma in his eyes till he was 11. But she also took his consent before putting the surma. Now, section 9.4. Read from lines, I remember other little tests too. And in her quiet way, she agreed. This section tells us how Wade's parents dealt with his blindness in their own different ways. Wade says he had to undergo many tests that his mother attributed. The mother noticed that the child was beginning to adapt to his blindness. He was rarely bumping into things. She thought his sight was returning. She attributed this change to her Hakim's medicines. She would then try other tricks to confirm that his sight was returning. She would have waved or she actually waved her hand and asked him to spot it. Initially, the child could not answer, but later he discovered a way out. He could feel the direction of the air, currents, and so started giving correct answers. She tried other methods too, to check his vision, such as asking how many fingers did she raise, or whether the light was on or off. Initially, the child could not answer all her questions, which disappointed her. Later, his clever mind devised to listen carefully to the sounds of the switch and gave correct answers much to the satisfaction of the mother. The narrator says that there was one problem which could not be tackled. His father read all possible literature on blindness that was available. In the process, he learned that most of India's blind landed up being beggars or could at best become owners of petty barn beady shops. This fate for his child was not acceptable to him. He wanted his son to study and be like other normal children. He wrote to various institutions and organizations, but none of them gave satisfactory replies. There were hardly any institutions which provided the right facilities. He also realized that if his son was allowed to stay at home, 
he would be pampered and would then remain a dependent child all his life. He continued his search for the right institution. Finally, he heard about the other school for the blind. He wrote to the principal, Dr. R. M. Haldar, who much to his relief not only accepted the child but also assured his father that he would take special interest in his case and promised special care and responsibility. The mother was shocked when she heard fathers. But she eventually, ultimately, gave in for she had faith in her husband's superior judgment. What are the salient points to learn from this lesson? Blindness needs to be accepted. It should not be treated as a major handicap. Disabled people should not be considered as a burden on society. Handicapped people need to be treated with empathy and not understanding. Society should treat them as a normal people. We should not underestimate the capability of a handicapped person. More and more specialized institutions should be opened which can teach them skills and teach them to use their inherent potential to the maximum. Ignorance which leads to superstitions needs to be banished totally. People should be more rational in their outlook. The concept of sin, vice, virtue and penance or atonement needs to be relooked. I hope by now you have become better equipped to handle your test. Do not become overconfident and best of luck. Thank you.